So thank you so much for thank you so much for um, joining us on this beautiful, uh, slightly windy day. Um, so I am a big lover of seafood, and one of the most important things that I've learned in about the last seven years as a personal chef is the importance of buying uh, local, fresh, whenever possible. Um, always check if you were to go to Whole Foods. Um, they have certain criteria, pretty strict on where they get their seafood from. Yes, they'll have some shrimp from Thailand or Vietnam, but um, usually they'll have wild caught local shrimp um, also, but it's always marked. So always make sure that it's fresh. Now fresh means that it's not been frozen. So make sure that if you really want to taste the full flavor of some wonderful fresh seafood, that you get it, um, you know, down at the coast at the fish market or off the boat, you know, it's coming in or that you can certainly find it. There's some great sources at the farmer's market. Um, if you're in Greensboro, there's a uh, George Smith is at the market on Saturday morning with scallops and tuna and shrimp. So I'm just a real big proponent on fresh, local, and whenever possible. And also feeds back to the economy for our North Carolina fishermen. So tonight's recipe is um, one of my favorites because it's so versatile. Um, we're using shrimp, you could also use scallops, you could use crab, you could use a uh, type of fish that you cut up into chunks like grouper or sea bass, um, things like that. But tonight I'm gonna use uh, shrimp, this is local. Um, it is fresh and it's beautiful. So whenever you see shrimp, um, what I bought for tonight's class is a 1620 shrimp, which means you're gonna get 16 to 20 shrimp per pound. Um, so that's always just a gauge on, you know, how big the shrimp are gonna be. So I thought we would start with um, cleaning the shrimp. Um, and another reason I wanted to showcase this recipe tonight is because a lot of folks, when I cook this dish or any dish with shrimp for friends, they always comment on the, how great the shrimp is. And I said, so we know a lot of people overcook shrimp. So I'm gonna show you some cooking stages of what it looks like, but um, let's get started with um, peeling the shrimp. These are your uh, shrimp for tonight's recipe. Um, the recipe calls for a, a two pounds. You can certainly back off on that, um, but you know that's, that just uh, goes well with the amount of pasta. So what I typically do is I just, I hold, I have the tail um, in one hand and I'm gonna peel, take my hands and peel, um, peel this back and then once you peel it back I'm, the legs just come right off and I'm going to do that. This is usually a two to three step and then I'm just going to squeeze the, uh, the tail and hopefully <laughs> this will come right out. So that's how you peel a shrimp. Now you're either going to have the digestive tract on the top of the shrimp or underneath. You can see this, is, this digestive tract is underneath um, or for the less technical shrimp poo. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna take this out. I just cut very shallow into the underbelly of the shrimp and pull that out. Um, the kids will just love it and be all grossed out. Um, but you always wanna be sure you, you clean your shrimp. Um, so devein is another word you probably heard of. So um, you'll either see it split an underbelly or in the back here. So that's, you know, I did that with all the shrimp, but I wanted to show you how to do that um, in case you, you weren't familiar. Maybe you buy the shrimp already cooked, which is a great convenience, and you certainly could do that. The other thing I wanna mention are the shells. If you, um, now this might be a little, uh, a little foodie, <clears throat> you know, foodie, nerdy, whatever, but I, if you make uh, anything like a clam chowder or you, you need um, a seafood stock, anytime you peel fresh shrimps, it's always great to keep the shells instead of throwing them away. Um, once I have all the shells, I just put them in a Ziploc bag, get the air out, seal it real well, and just throw them in the freezer. Um, or you could go ahead and make your stock and then freeze the stock. But the stock is just water and the uh, shrimp shells and you know, you could add salt or just, you know, wait until you're actually using something. But that is a great way to make some a really nice, nice stock. Um, I chose angel hair. One, it's my personal favorite. I don't know if there's a whole wheat angel hair on the market. There may be. 
Um, but the most important thing that with angel hair is not to overcook it. Because it is such a fine um, cut pasta, it'll get real gummy on you um, if you overcook it. So as soon as the pasta cooked to the package, I usually go at, um, under a minute um, based on what they recommend. But I will put it in the colander after I save the pasta water. I'll put it in a colander and then I'll put cold water on it. And that just stops the cooking process. You could also use um, rice. You could use cauliflower rice. You could use wild rice. You could use quinoa, which would increase the protein. You could use anything to mix this up with. This dish is great hot and it's also really good cold. Um, so with the summer, you know, a fast approaching, this is a great cold, cold dish. So what we're going to do is I'm going to mix, um, mix our sauce together. And part of that recipe is to zest the lemon. If you don't have one of these microplane, I uh, highly suggest getting one. I use these for zesting um, citrus fruit. I also use it for fresh nutmeg, which I use year round. But basically, um, you're wanting to zest just the peel because this white part is a little bitter. So as you are um, zesting, I'm sort of rolling the lemon because if you were to just keep zesting, zesting, you would get cut through that pith, which is the bitter part. So I'm zesting. This is going to add so much flavor. Um, lemon tarts have a lot of zest in them. Um, you know, lemon meringue pie, unfortunately, all those wonderful, rich, tasty, uh, in moderation, desserts. Um, so you notice I just tapped this and then there'll be a little bit of collection of zest right here on the, on the micro. Now I have already um, got my lemon juice here, but another kitchen tool that I love, um, most of the lemons I buy do have seeds in them. And if you don't have one of these um, juicers, this is, you know, I've, I've got my, my grandmother's glass, you know, uh, lemon juicer that's just great. Uh, and I have it and I love looking at it and I use it every now and then. This is, I, I like real practical kitchen tools and this is one of them. So not only does this do a great job of juicing the lemon, but it also keeps the seeds from getting into the juice. So a good little squeeze. That's a lot of lemon juice, but that's going to be probably about, uh, I don't know, two thirds of a cup from the lemons. So I'm going to, and I might be doing this a little bit differently for um, the Zoom. Just, you know, so bear with me if I'm not following the directions exactly. So we've got um, the lemon juice. We've got the honey. Um, this is a great local honey um, that adds some sweetness because there's so much acid with the lemon juice. You want to bat, the honey's going to balance it out. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. You can leave that out if you'd like. Some really good freshly ground black pepper. I'm going to add um, some of this pasta water. And I can always add a little bit more. But this, the great ingredient that really makes this unique is the almond butter. And <clears throat> this is sort of a take on, I did a dinner party in um, December. It was kind of weird because everybody was wearing masks. But um, I was doing seared scallops with a lemon juice and it had sugar and I reduced that down to sort of a syrupy condition, con consistency, which took forever. And it was really good, but I thought something needed, I needed something to add to give it more body. So this is um, just almond butter. That's about two tablespoons. Um, you can you know, measure if you would like. And then I'm just going to whisk this together and it will make a nice sauce. So one of the reasons that you want to cool your angel hair is so that um, if it were hot, it would um, soak up a lot more of the, of the juice than you would probably want. You can also add um, vegetable stock. You could add the seafood stock that I talked about earlier. You could add, um, if you want more of a sauce, and I would probably be doing this in a, in a, a saucepan, because that's going to help the, uh, all the ingredients to um, dissolve, like the honey would dissolve quicker if you were doing this in a saucepan. But I just wanted you to sort of get a feel for the consistency. And I'm going to let this rest just for a, just for a minute and talk about the shrimp. So I mentioned um, 
the shrimp, it's very easy to overcook. So this recipe, I thought this would be a neat way for you, another way to show you how to cook shrimp in case you aren't comfortable cooking it on the stove, and that is in the oven. So uh, I believe the recipe says at 400 degrees, you'll put the shrimp, cleaned shelled shrimp, um, on a sheet pan. I would like to use parchment paper. And then um, the, you don't keep it in there very long. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples. Um, I watch for the shrimp to start turning pink from a gray to a pink and when it starts to curl. So this would be super underdone. This is really just really just done on, on one side, but you can see it's not, it's very opaque, if you will. So that would be, you know, that's probably got another 45 seconds to go. And then this is a little bit, cooked a little bit more. This is getting there, we're getting really close. So you're gonna be watching it on the sheet pan. And then this is the perfectly cooked shrimp. It is um, holding its shape, it's a beautiful color of pink or salmon color, and it's not curled up super tight, but it's curled and it's cooked. And so I thought I'd bring over the skillet, because you can certainly do this in a skillet on the, on the stove instead of the oven, but I wanted to give you the oven method um, just to give you a different way of cooking it. I know that some people have made barbecue shrimp, but they put all the shrimp on the cheap pan and then they'll, when it comes out, they'll toss it in their favorite barbecue sauce. Um, you know, of course, be careful because a lot of those will have a lot of sugar and salt in them, but that's another really, really good recipe. So I'm gonna bring over, I'm gonna move this out of the way and I'm gonna bring over the shrimp and the cast iron skillet, I'll be right back. So all of these shrimp um, I actually did in the skillet, um, my mom's skillet. Um, so these are the shrimp, they, uh, I'll reserve the, the butter. Um, this recipe also has olive oil in it. So I'm gonna just kind of show you how um, I would probably recommend tossing the pasta in a bowl with the sauce, but for tonight, I'll, I'll do it sort of in a, a sh sort of a showy little pretty, pretty for format. Um, this is also garnished with basil. Um, I just planted my basil, so it's not really um, thriving yet. I hope some of y'all are planting some herbs because it's a great way to um, add great green fresh flavor let me just um drizzle this shrimp butter the shrimp butters off would also be good on toast um also good in this pasta so now and again you know you would be you would um this would probably thicken up if it were on the stove so this is why i didn't add all of the pasta water because you know, I want it to be a little thick, but the pasta is gonna soak up these flavors. And I wanted to, to share with you another thing. Um, this is a very delicious recipe as is, but if you wanted to take it to another step, you could use, follow this recipe, but add some fresh ginger, or add more basil, or add uh, low sodium soy sauce. The, um, almond butter with the ginger and the soy sauce is a very um, easy blend of making a peanut sauce that you get in some of the Asian restaurants. Um, you could keep going with it, add a little heat with your red chili flakes um, would be really nice. But you could take, you could see where you could take this, um, you know, further. And you could even leave the pasta out, cook the shrimp, um, or marinate the shrimp in this sauce and make some great shrimp tacos. It would be nice and then shred some purple cabbage for crunch, um, maybe some celery and sweet onion. But the almond butter, just to any, with any recipe like this and the lemon juice and the honey, just those three flavors alone are delicious. And then somewhere I've got my little pitiful wilted torn basil but you know i believe we eat with our eyes i think if it's pretty we're gonna we're you know when you get here at a restaurant and the waiter brings you you know your plate you you want to feel good about it so this is the shrimp with the angel hair pasta um 
and the great almond and lemon juice and honey sauce. And I just, I think you'll really love it. Um, if you're cooking this for friends that are, um, you're getting ready to sit down, maybe call them in as you're straining the uh, angel hair. You know, that's how close you want to call it if you're serving it hot. But again, this is a, this is a great dish cold as well. So I think you're going to really enjoy having this recipe for the summer months. And I would love to get some of your questions or comments. Um, know if any of y'all are making this from home. I know Jasmine sent out the, the recipe so you could follow along and we'd love to hear how that turned out. Yes, this looks delicious, Lynn. Um, somebody asked if you could just briefly just talk about the tip that you said about cooking the shrimp and what to look for. Okay, sure. Um, so if you have it, um, so if you're doing it in a skillet, I get the um, either the butter or the olive oil or avocado oil in the pan and I get the pan hot with the oil, get that hot. And then I add in a single layer the shrimp and they're going to immediately start turning pink. I would give it one minute and then I would turn the shrimp. This is again, if you're doing it in the skillet, turn the shrimp uh, when they're looking like this. So one side is gray, one side is lightly pink. That is when you turn it. And then when they look like this, um, they've curled, but they're not super, super tight. Um, then turn, take them off the heat completely. And I would even maybe remove them from the, from the skillet. Um, that's to guarantee you won't overcook them. No matter how large they are, that's pretty much the rule of thumb. So you could cook a small shrimp the same way you would cook a jumbo shrimp. Um, of course, the larger the shrimp, it's going to take a little bit longer to get that curl on it, but that's when you would turn them over. Um, and if you're not quite sure, pop one in, give it a taste, and um, you know, see how you like it. But you'll be amazed by not overcooking the shrimp, um, just how much more flavor and texture they have. If you're doing them on the cookie sheet um, or the baking sheet, the same thing, but turn the oven up you know, to 400 and just watch them with your oven light. Um, when they start turning pink, you might want to flip them over, give them another minute or so, and then take them out of the oven and let them, let them just rest on the stove top. Great, thanks for that. Um, someone else has a question. It says, you mentioned frozen, uh, deveined shrimp versus fresh is okay. Would you bake in the oven at the same after thawing? Great question. Um, so yes, on the baking, and um, I'm I'm certainly not anti-frozen about you know all the time, but um, it's just where it comes from. So um, you could certainly buy um, you know uncooked shrimp. Just you know um, see where it, see where it comes from. If you're in a hurry, you need to buy the cocktail shrimp that's already cooked. You know by all means. I, um, you know I think this is going to add more flavor. I think the convenience of having the shrimp um, already cooked, it, you're just not going to have the pop of flavor. Um, like I wonder whenever I see those tray, cocktail, shrimp cocktail trays, I love shrimp cocktail, but whenever I see those trays and I'll see like there's a date on there of, you know, three weeks from now in the refrigerator, there's a red light that goes off in my head. You know, I'm like, what are they, what are they doing to the shrimp or what's the shrimp preserved in? Um, I don't know that process. But that's why I'm just a big fan of, um, you know, fresh, fresh seafood or freshly frozen. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, how much pasta water did you add to the sauce? Um, so I reserved a cup and I probably used a third of a cup. Um, and as that cooks down and reduces in your saucepan, you can just keep adding more. You can also skip using the pasta water and add a chicken stock or seafood stock or a vegetable broth to it. But I would start out with about a third of a cup. Lynn, I wanted to make a couple of comments, um, you know, sort of piggybacking on what you were talking about, uh, how you were talking about not overcooking the shrimp. It just seems like that is kind of a recurrent theme that I hear from a lot of chefs, don't overcook the meat don't overcook the, the fish, common mistakes that are made. Um, but in addition to that, what I often hear chefs say is, and, and you did it too, 
don't overcook the pasta. Mm -hmm. And so I want to add to that when you cook the pasta to just al dente, where it is has a little bit of um, still um, structure to it, it is actually going to be better for those of you trying to control your blood sugar because the more you cook it, the more you make that carbohydrate, um, the, uh, the bioavailability of it is a little bit greater. It is more easily digested fully and absorbed. So you get more of the carbohydrate out of it, you might say, with mm -hmm. the really mushy overcooked pasta. Not the, and we've got to remember, pasta is pasta. You're always going to get carbohydrate. It is going to raise your blood sugar, but it's going to be better if you can lean on the side of less cooked than more cooked. Right. I, I agree. And the only time, this is just uh, just kind of not, not trying to be funny, but the only time I like overcooked pasta is, um, you know, macaroni and cheese. It's just like kind of, you know, the overcooked pasta blended with the cheese goo, but I'm, you know, certainly went in a uh, off the track with that comment. But when you're ever you're doing penne, the you know the like maybe it's a two inch you know penne pasta or the bow ties or you just don't want a mushy overcooked um, pasta. So I just usually rule of thumb is whatever the box says. I go um, one minute under that. So if it says ten minutes, I'll cook it for nine. Because the, the few seconds that I'm transferring it to the colander and the sink, it's still cooking. And if you don't rinse it with cold water, it's going to continue to cook, just like the shrimp or, you know, any other foods. Uh, someone else asked how much, oh, we already went over that, sorry, about the pasta water. Um, Recipe indicates toss the pasta in the sauce, but you poured it over the shrimp. Which is best? Um, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, it, as long as it's um, you know mixed well, I would say you know make sure the pasta is coated with the sauce, and then um, you know you can put it all together. Certainly, I just you know this was a little different doing it with Zoom because um, we're not moving or doing zoom in and cooking shots. Um, so it's one reason I did it this way, but you could certainly put it all in, um, you know, together. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't do the, um, like the shrimp from the raw state like this. I'd probably cook the shrimp and leave that out, but make sure it gets some sauce on it. But I would toss the, the angel hair with the sauce. You could certainly do that. I'd like to make one more comment. Um, about something, following up on something you said, Lynn, and you talked about making it look beautiful and the value of using the herbs that way or just any number of things. And, you know, I have this conversation with patients a fair number of times. In fact, just this afternoon, I again had this conversation about how important it is that we get satisfaction from our foods. When we are trying to um, be cautious about our food choices or limit portion sizes. Maybe we're, uh, again, trying to control our blood sugar, or trying to control our weight or cholesterol, whatever it is. Um, sometimes we don't pay enough attention to preparing foods in a way that are truly satisfying. Um, you know, we almost feel like we can't enjoy the food too much. That's mm -hmm. totally a wrong approach because we are hardwired to get enjoyment from food. So if you want to really do the best at controlling your appetite, you'll take those extra few minutes to make sure what you're preparing is delicious and that it looks beautiful. That's, that's really important. And of course, that means setting aside enough time, not just to prepare your foods, but to be able to sit down and savor every bite. I'm so glad you uh, spoke some more on that because it's it's one of my you know favorite things um, to do certainly when I'm cooking for other people and I forget to do it for myself so I think that's really important. Um, somebody wanted to share that they they made the recipe along with you and that it's uh, quite good. Oh good! Yes, yeah. yay! That's always good to. That's always good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. 
So those of you that are maybe thinking about making this later, we, you know, hopefully it's, you feel the same. <laughs> uh, somebody has another question. Does rinsing the pasta affect the flavor of the pasta? I heard you never rinse pasta. So I, the only reason I'm rinsing the pasta is to stop the cooking process. Um, I, you know, to, to, to go back, I salted my water really well um, and got it to a rolling boil. So that's going to add some flavor. You can also um, cook pasta or rice in broth, like vegetable broth or chicken broth. That's going to add some flavor. So if any, it's really, um, and it's not going to be under the water long, but it's, um, it's really just to stop the cooking process. So if you, um, you know, you certainly don't need to do that, but it also gets some of the extra starch rinsed off of the pasta, which is causing the gumminess, even if it's not overcooked. Um, but it's not reducing any of the flavor of the pasta. Pasta is pretty bland to me. Um, you know, I think it's the salt. And um, of course, if it's homemade pasta, you get a rich egg flavor, but um, it, it, it won't it won't affect the, the flavor of pasta cooked in, in a salted boiling water. Great. Um, one of the participants who was cooking along said they didn't use all the sauce. Can they save the leftovers? And if so, how long will it last in the fridge? So yes, as you can see, I've got extra um, sauce too. What I will probably do is either put this in a blender or uh, if you have a um, immersion blender that's just kind of thick, some thickens it up. You might even could add some, um, uh, just a little bit of olive oil. You've got oil in the almond butter, but this is a great salad dressing. Um, so, uh, and I, for a salad dressing, the only other ingredient that I would add is maybe some fresh ginger. So um, you can either save the sauce, I would say up to two weeks in a glass jar in the refrigerator. Um, but, but by all means, either use it on pasta or rice or, you know, maybe on to drizzle on, you know, fi another fish dish. It would be great on chicken, but it's a really good salad dressing when you add a little bit of fresh ginger. Awesome. Jenny, do you have anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, I would like to ask Lynn because you're, uh, yeah, I've just seen so many great meals that you've made and, and your planning, meal planning skills. Um, like to get your input on, of course, I'm going to ask, what vegetables would you put with this meal? Yay, I'm so glad you asked. Um, asparagus is fresh right now. Um, some, I've just bought, um, cooked the other day for a client, some white and green asparagus and I actually cut it, you know, into maybe one inch pieces and sauteed it in lemon butter. Um, you know, you could do asparagus tips would be great. Um, I also to add a lot more color, you could, um, saute some sweet red, orange or yellow bell peppers. That would be great. Um, the, let's see sweet peas would be wonderful. Um, another thing that I love to do to add to dishes like this in the summer is when the corn comes in, um, you know, cook the corn like on the grill or just put it in a cast iron skillet to get a char on it and then cut the, you know, corn off the cob like right onto the dish and then you have these beautiful charred ribs of fresh corn. It looks great and it tastes fantastic. It gives a little crunchy flavor. There's some corn I don't even cook. Um, it's fresh off the cob and I just, I just cut it and I just put it raw right into the dish. Um, it's that sweet. So those are some ideas. You know, any vegetable would work. I would even, um, you could even take like a baby organic um, spinach, maybe, peel, maybe pick the stems off and not cook it at all, but just toss it in the, the warm pasta and serve all that together with the shrimp and the sauce. Those are some, yeah, you know, some ideas that would really add a lot more color and be just super, you know, you could add it to the dish or serve it on the side. Nice. Those, sound, those all sound great. Um, I, I've been using a lot of asparagus lately and, you know, it is in season this time of year. Um, and I know what I do, a very simple um, roasting, cut the ends off, of course, and then just put a little bit of salt or olive oil first, little spray of olive oil, 
little salt and just garlic powder. I mean, it couldn't uh, get yeah. easier. And then I roasted at 450 for 15 minutes or so. Yep. Do you have any other suggestions for the um, asparagus? Um, so I do it in a similar way. I will get the pan really hot and just barely any oil. I'll take a paper towel and just kind of wipe the excess out. And I put it, put the asparagus in um, the hot skillet and I just, I don't touch it because I let it that, you know, get to the surface and then it's charring and caramelizing. And then I'll take tongs. It's a little time consuming, but uh, maybe a minute. And then I'll, uh, depending on how thick the asparagus is, and then I'll just take my tongs and turn the asparagus and get the same caramelization on the other side. And then I remove it because my clients are actually um, heating their asparagus up and I'd rather have it underdone so that it's perfect when they heat it up. Um, I also like a little bit of crunch um, and carrots, you know, are kind of the same way I do. I'll get a char on the carrots and then I'll put them in the oven to finish them off. Um, but I do the asparagus a lot the same way. And I also love asparagus on the grill because you've really got to watch it or it'll, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll burn up really quickly. But I love that flavor of that smoke and the, uh, the wood or the charcoal. Um, and let me just add one other thing. I found a recipe, of course, like all of us on the internet. And it's for cream of asparagus soup. It's really easy. It's two pounds of asparagus. Well, I've modified it a little bit because I, when I first made it, I didn't have any leeks, so I just used an onion. So two pounds of asparagus, an onion, um, and two medium-sized Yukon gold potatoes. Mm. And that gives it some consistency that allows you to use a little less fat. The other ingredient that's called for as you puree it, after you cook it with a little bit of vegetable or chicken broth um, is originally called for 2%, not fat-free, but low-fat Greek yogurt. Mm. But uh, what I've used is about a half cup of goat cheese, chevre. Yes. Oh, great. And it is absolutely delicious, and it's so easy. And, you know, it feels a little uh, special. Right, almost like a like a uh, like a hollandaise, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. I love that idea. Oh, and toasted pumpkin seeds on top for garnish. Very pretty and tastes great. Yum, yum. Yes, I love pumpkin seeds. That would actually be good on this, and also pine nuts would be good, or almonds even. And let's not forget. All the nuts and seeds are really good for us. Right, yes. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, one more person just asked, uh, they never have used almond butter before, so do you normally store it in the fridge or in the cupboard? And, and they said olive oil? Oh, almond butter. Oh, almond butter. So um, you can store it in the cabinet, in the pantry. I like, um, I pour the oil off when I, when I buy it. I pour the oil off and just throw it away um, because, you know, I just, I don't need it. And um, I actually like cold almond butter. That's just a temperature thing for me. Like if I'm going to put it on toast in the morning, I just like, I just like cold almond butter. Um, but you could, you, either one, either way, you could, um, you know, Nuts, I do keep in the freezer so they don't get rancid, but almond butter, peanut butter, um, things like that, I, either way, pantry or refrigerator. It just depends on your personal um, preference. And how fast you use it. How fast I use it? No, I'm saying if you, if you use just a couple of tablespoons of almond butter every right. so often, it, right. you probably want to keep it refrigerated. And yeah. almond butter being a more polyunsaturated fat, versus peanut butter is gonna have a better shelf life. Usually I tell people that the enemies of, especially the unsaturated fats are air, heat, and light. Mm -hmm. But at my house, we go through almond butter pretty quickly, so it stays in the cupboard. Very, very good. And that might be why I keep it in the refrigerator. I, I don't, you know, I don't use it a lot. Um, you know, one teaspoon at night with some milk, I'm like totally satisfied and ready for bed. So 
um, you know, that may be why I'll keep it in the refrigerator just subconsciously. But yeah, I, yeah that's a great point, Jeannie. Thank you. You know, uh, Shannon, I saw somebody had asked about um, Lynn's background and just want to reiterate the comment that you are awesome. So oh. <laughs> tell, tell us all, share with us your background and how you got into all this stuff, if you would. I would, I would love to. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, how much time do we have? I'll have you, I'll have you guys out by nine. But um, it's uh, sort of sort been cooking since I was um, tall enough to reach the stove. My mom didn't know at the time, but when she propped me up on the counter to teach me how what a stiff peak was when we were making whipped cream, or she taught me in this cast iron skillet right here. Um, I watched her, and she would just tell me kind of like when to turn the fried chicken. Um, of course, she was cooking it in, in you know Crisco, um, but I was I just it didn't take me long to figure out if I hung out with mom. Uh, as her firstborn, um, that I could also eat. <laughs> so um, I ended up uh, working in restaurants in college and then um, finished at UNCG and got my degree in um, nutrition and hospitality management, which was a lot of chemistry, believe it or not. Um, and then went back and um, became a registered dietitian, I worked with Jeannie um, a lot, and also got some personal counseling from Jeannie because, um, you know, I, I love, I love food. Um, I love, um, I love good food. Um, that doesn't mean I won't have some Cheez-Its in the morning when I wake up. Um, but, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm human and I'm very transparent. But it's all come together. Seven years ago, I was catering a business party for a friend of mine downtown. And the editor of Our State Magazine happened to be at the party. I did not know who she was. Um, wonderful woman, um, Elizabeth Hudson. I'll give her a shout out. I'd made some pimento cheese. It's just a recipe I, you know, make from scratch. And she commented on it. And like I do when I meet a lot of interesting folks, I'll just, I'm, I won't like stalk or anything, but I'll follow them, follow up with them on an email. Like if I see something local or I think like I was at a lavender farm, you know, months after we met and I just emailed her, I said, you know, I know you get thousands of comments for um, stories, but you know, this lavender farm is just really spectacular. So we sort of kept up that way. And then months later, like a year later, I, I literally fell into the role of recipe developer for our state magazine. And here we are seven years later, I, I do four recipes a month. Um, we just finished up the photo shoot for um, the July issue. So we're working um, far ahead. I also fell in love with food styling. So I do food styling for magazines and farms and individuals that want to showcase their food in cookbooks or magazines. Um, for instance, this is, a, I'm looking at this sort of, you know, a food stylist, we get the tweezers out and we get the food brushes out and um, all, but I, I'm a food stylist for real food. Um, I don't do any you know, anything fake, like fake, I, I don't do mashed potatoes for ice cream. I use real ice cream and it's a lot trickier, but we're placing things. And if you next, next food photograph that you see, look at it really closely, like how the spoon is placed. If there's a napkin for texture folded. Um, I think the longest we spent folding a napkin was 20 minutes. I mean, there's just all these things that like ah, drive me crazy, but it's fun. I've, so I've got, an exciting opportunity coming up that I'll share with you later uh, uh, next week, food styling for a major cookbook. Um, but I'm also a cook for clients. I, uh, you know, being a diet, being a, being a former dietitian, um, I, uh, you know, and being a foodie and, and all that, um, I can just kind of create recipes off the top of my head. I thought everybody could do that. So fortunately, um, also seven years ago, I was fortunate enough to, um, you know, start um, a business and I tell people all the time I could barely um, spell much less pronounce entrepreneur and I am one so um, things just tend to work out last year was really rough and um, I tell people if you drive down battleground or any street where you live every single restaurant is hiring they're not just hiring for cooks they're hiring for front of the house um, it's COVID really um, they closed, you know, a lot of places had to close. So those of us who were, you know, I, I changed. That's when I got into more food styling. And that's when I started doing some 
other things. I wasn't cooking in clients' homes, so I had to come up with, um, you know, ways to keep the business running. But I've always, you know, just had food in my life, and um, I'm just really grateful. I a lot of times I say I wish I had, I wish all, all of this had come together when I was in my 30s, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't. It wasn't my time. So um, because I never thought being fit, and I don't mean a size. Um, but being fit as in strength, I didn't think that sh was ever going to need to be part of my business plan. So like right now, my den is I've got boxes of plates and napkins and silverware and platters and all that to take to this food styling job. Well, I've got to get that in my car. And then tomorrow I drive to Carrie to unload it, unpack everything. And then when we're finished with the shoot, I get to wrap it all up, load it back in my car, get home and then unload it. And that is, um, that's a workout. So I learned very quickly, um, you know, what heating pads to stick on <laughs> my body after a long day. Um, but that is, that's, you know, and here we are, you know, the fact that I work with Jeannie, the fact that I used to work at Cone for 21 years, it's amazing to me how things cycle back. And here we are talking about health and food and um, goodness and local. And I, you know, now more than ever appreciate it because if I do all the things I'm talking about, then I'm going to get to work longer and cook for many years. So, I mean, that's what it's all about. And I probably took way too long, but, um, you know, thanks for, thanks for listening. And, um, it's certainly a topic that I could talk about all night. Wow. That was that was really great to hear, Lynn. That was really, um, thanks for sharing that with us. I could see a lot of smiling faces in the, in the cameras here, um, but you've gotten a couple comments. Thank you for all the great information. We've cooked along with you. We've really enjoyed it. Thanks for the recipe. This is great. Thanks so much for sharing. So we really appreciate you taking the time to show us through this. You got some thumbs up, <laughs> I can see through the camera. So um, thanks. Does anyone else have any, any questions or? Um, I did see someone say, Ginny, if you could share that recipe, maybe we can send that out. Someone is interested in that, your asparagus recipe. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Um, should I send that to J.M. McNeil? Yes. We'll do that. Yep. All right. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. We really enjoyed it. Um, thanks, Lynn, for showing us all, you. your, all your expertise. And um, I can't wait to cook this myself, hopefully this weekend. But um, thank you. Yeah. If anyone else doesn't have any other questions, we hope you join us next month um, when we have another cooking class. Um, but until then, we hope you have a great evening. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.